Nathan and Paranel, and give them a hand, please. Hey, thanks very much for the warm introduction. I uh, may be talking about something slightly different than what you were expecting, and it says parallel programming, but what I'm mainly going to be talking about is actually distributed programming. Uh, and because I'm going to be using parallel in a very broad sense, which just basically means running more than one thing at the same time. One of my other objectives is to actually give people some experience at hunting into the standard library and going and changing things to make it more useful. And I'd also like to just initiate a conversation with anyone else uh, and I'm more than happy to, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be able to start a discussion about people who are interested in this kind of stuff. Now, the way we are going to operate today's talk is to introduce a chaos, sort of a problem, and then we're going to implement it five or six ways. Again, we are use, I'm using this term parallel, but concurrent and distributed, I'm going to be almost intentionally misusing those terms and using them as synonyms, even though that is incorrect. So why would you like to do parallel programming? To start off with, you've got tasks on the left, and you want to be able to move them over to the right. And uh, if you run in a distributed or parallel manner, you can do more than one thing at once. Alternatively, you've got some process that takes T time, and you want it to actually complete more quickly. So if there are some things off the, power, uh, off the critical path, you may as well get them done on the side. Alternatively, uh, if an error happens uh, that isn't actually on the critical path, you still want your main function to go through. So if you're serving web requests and you have some analytics function, you don't want any interruption there to actually hurt the client, who is actually, you know, the web user doesn't want that 500 error, it just, they just want a web page. How about we, uh, we're actually kind of concerned about surveillance, and we think to ourselves, you know, how practical will it be for the government to scan every image on the internet? And how, ma how many images could we get for a hundred bucks. And then we could just make some, some crazy wild extrapolation. So that is our project, pro that's, that's what we're gonna try and solve today. If you can get onto the internet, what can you, uh, what can you get? So this is sort of some pseudo code. Uh, what we do is we start with, we, we retrieve a URL with this get function, then we extract some, some other URLs which happen to be images we download those, we then detect faces, and we yield each the coordinates of each face within each image. That's, uh, that's basically a sort of a fairly workable thing to do. And uh, where could we do two things at the same time? We've got some network-bound problems, and we've got some CPU-bound problems. But effectively, everything that is looped could be done independently. There is no need for one image to be uh, talking to another image. They can all be run concurrently. So this is actually that same function. It's just happened to be inlined. And I apologize for people who will attempt to interpret this, but let's just walk through it. So we first download the page. Uh, we then extract URLs. Um, what this regular expression is doing is matching HTTPS word characters punctuation. And then as long as it finishes with sort of an a, an ex a file extension that is useful to us, we then uh, get it from the page while ignoring cases. This cascade thing is, is, a, is a mathematical model that the OpenCV system requires. Uh, cascade is terminology that's used within uh, OpenCV. We then create a, a memory buffer. And uh, so URL, comma, extension, the, the regular expression actually pumps out uh, tuples. We then go and download the content and continue if uh, something was malformed. <coughs> now, uh, because of the way OpenCV works and the way the Python bindings actually operate, I found it was a lot easier to just write to a template file than go and... Uh, 
deserialize it in, internal string, trying to infer the, the, the actual data type, uh, the compression, decompress it, and then convert it to a, an array, which I then pump into OpenCV. So I just I let OpenCV do it itself by creating a named file, loading it in, and uh, this is wrong, by the way. There's supposed to be an OpenCV constant, but even if you just give it a Boolean, it just works fine, apparently. Uh, we actually conduct the facial recognition, and we uh, delete that temporary file. So this is the get function. This is that extract URLs. And here's the detect faces. So that's how it relates to what, what happened earlier. So the first thing we can do is introduce multiprocessing. If we have a multi-core uh, computer, we can uh, do things concurrently. The, one of the things we can use is this is pool class. Now, a pool will spawn up a, uh, a bunch of processes that can actually just be tasked work. And Python will take care of the, chant, take care of the problem of actually allocating uh, tasks to be done to processes that are available to you. CPU count isn't completely cross-platform, but it's probably good enough for a slide. And what we end up doing is going and extracting things and uh, using a parallelized map function. Just as a side note, if you're using things that are I.O. bound, <coughs> Threading is actually fine. You probably don't need to worry about multiprocessing, but because we have this computer vision component, it's probably quite useful that we do use multiprocessing for the tasks that we've currently got. So we now need to apply it to web scale because that's kind of the new hotness. So here is a bottle web app. Uh, you'll see what's, if, if you haven't used bottle, the, the, the one up the top is a a URL faces which receives a request parameter URL and we then fire off this function people in pages and that, that, that's just a, uh, should actually just sort of be, be an integer but um, and we just have an index page which, which, is, which is this form field and we can just run that on localhost if we felt like it. Uh, so there's no reason why we, we just do all this uh, on a single computer. So in Python, here are sort of four ways. These aren't the only ways, but uh, I, th I thought I'd pick these out because they represent different categories of, of um, conducting work in parallel. We can sort of create our own thing using uh, an RPC mechanism or some message queue. Uh, let's go away. Celery is a is actually sort of a really, as an abstraction above a missing queuing system. Disco is an implementation of MapReduce that works on Python. And IPython is for um, something that's just a, actually has a cluster management system that enables you to interactively manage uh, potentially dozens or hundreds of computers and create acyclic uh, graphs that will actually go and route the uh, functions and arguments all together really, really nicely. It's quite crazy how, how good it is. So XML RPC is where we'll start. And you may hate XML, and you just really want to get rid of it. But XML RPC is actually quite a well-rounded spec. And uh, an implementation exists within the standard library. Therefore, we should may as well just at least figure out what, what we, where we should start from. So uh, it's, it is less scary without the boilerplate. What we do is we uh, register these introspection functions for, for specification compliance. Here is our people in pages function that we created before. We just register it under this uh, people uh, alias. If we don't include that, we'll just call it people in pages from the underscore underscore name method. And that's, that's, that's the... That's the RPC server. And uh, how do we connect it to a website? Well, this was the original. And uh, what we do is we replace. So what we're going to do is add a little bit between from bottle and above uh, root faces. Uh, we add another import statement, which provides Python 3 compliance. And uh, we just add this RPC uh, proxy thing, 
which will go and connect to that server and then provide dynamically using some dynamic introspection a people method. And that's what we happened to uh, name our, our function. So Python is actually going to do a lot of hard work to make it really easy for you and to make it look like it's a local function call even though it's actually s serializing your job, shipping it off to another computer and then receiving the result back. Uh, very good. So, like, how has this helped? Like, it hasn't yet. Uh, I admit that. <laughs> uh, we're only using one call, and uh, <coughs> we've actually lost some performance because we do need to have these serialization and messaging steps. But we can imagine some future state in which you have a load balancing proxy, which then itself splits out requests between several different RPC layers. So if you had a whole bunch of workers behind, say, an invented web server like Nginx, it could act as a load balancer, and the server proxy thing wouldn't know that it's actually talking to 50 machines, but it would actually handle things well enough to, to, do, anything, to do things useful with. So, but that really isn't good enough for what we want. Uh, can we, because it, it, it just is a single threaded RPC server, can we, can we do something multi-threaded or multi-processing actually within that server itself? Uh, how about we fork an OS process to, to, con to do this um, fa facial recognition? Uh, every time it, is, it receives a, uh, a new request. <laughs> this is an extract from the standard library. If we just remove some of the comments, uh, we still have something that's sort of fairly ugly, but hopefully slightly more intelligible. Uh, what we're doing is actually including socket server.tcp server in there. So there's a mixin class. And that kind of gives us a hint, because if we replace that with, say, Socket Surfer also has a mix-in called forked TCP server, we could possibly just sub that in, and we should get something that kind of works. Uh, there's this other dispatcher thing, which provides uh, the request handling. But remember that we can't just, just subclass and use, you know, sort of subclass and then pass, because there are sort of hard-coded values inside the init function. So we're going to have to overwrite that ourselves. For uh, uh, there, There's this thing, um, which we just won't touch, uh, because there's some kind of, in that comment section before, indicated that it, we should just leave it alone. Uh, we add an import, or a couple of import statements. The first one is fcntl, sort of file control. Uh, we need this because down in, in down in the depths of that uh, error handling thing, down the bottom in the last line, you'll notice that it's required. But uh, this is the magic. Forking TCP server is going to fork an OS process every time it receives a request. Has anyone heard of Geovent? So Geovent runs users' coroutines rather than uh, threads or, or processes. And it's, ex it's really, really excellent for problems bound by I.O. Now, we actually do exactly the same thing, uh, but we use, oh yeah, can you spot the differences? Uh, firstly, we monkey patch, we import gevent, and then it will go and patch socket for us. And then we just use a quote, our quote, same threaded TCP server, which now is actually using coroutines rather than threads. That's, that's all we need to do. Now, salary. Sure. Well, error handling is something uh, that I was hoping to sort of avoid. Um, now, I am not sure whether or not it's just going to close the thread and just kind of pop up again. Um, but my expectation is that the standard library is robust enough to be able, if there was some error within a process or a thread, to be able to sort of monitor that and, and sort of restart 
however, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, error handling is itself a, a problem. It, it's a task queue, but it can actually, you know, how we use GEvent for, for, for I.O. problems, but we wanted to use multi-processing for CPU bound problems. It actually has, because it uses AMQP underneath, it can actually route tasks to the right workers. Which means that, you know, if, you use, if you're using threads for I.O., you might sort of have a soft limit of a couple hundred, depending on how much memory and how many CPUs you're using. Uh, with coroutines, you can probably have thousands of web requests running um, concurrently. And this is all it takes, is the decorated function. Uh, there is a little bit more to it once you, you need to run a sort of a server process as well. There's this thing called salary control and executable that you just run. Uh, and this decorator will take care of getting your tasks. It serializes JSON, send it to the right place, and then your configuration will actually take care of getting it to the right workers. Now, uh, everyone who's used IPython for sort of interactive programming knows that it looks just like a shell, but because it is developed for scientific computing, there's actually a lot more available to you. And one of the most useful things is uh, its support for parallel cluster computing itself. So here's a very small diagram of what an IPython cluster looks like. Rather than just typing IPython into a prompt, you just type IP cluster to create something that looks like this. Uh, you don't know it when you're using the IPython shell, but it's talking to a controller, which itself talks to engines, which could be local processes. They could be other processes that it talks to via SSH. They could be batch systems like, uh, like for example, the portable batch system or some other batch uh, thing. And there's also, it will also create an MPI universe. If you know what MPI means, that will make sense to you. There's also some, there is scheduling magic going on in the middle, but it's sort of hidden from you as a user. Now to use it, we create a parallel profile, uh, which is basically just, it just creates some configuration files for you. We then call IP cluster with the number of processes that we want to uh, actually start up. And then we can just begin uh, working on the notebook. This is what the IPython notebook sort of looks like to you. We import this parallel <laughs> client, uh, and then we've now got a remote client using profile underscore, well, profile underscore name. And because we, in, our, in, the, in the previous setting, we, we, we sort of gave it four, we, we now have four IDs. To use any function, in the IPython manner, we need to create what it calls a direct view. Now, to create a direct view of the engines that are running, we use the slice syntax, which kind of may sound odd, but the, that slice syntax is going to provide you all of the engines that that controller is talking to you. And, uh, and then we just apply functions asynchronously. So, that uh, is actually the bulk of what I was going to say. However, there are lots of other problems when you want to run parallel programming. One of them is that you don't want to serialize your data and then ship it across the world for it to be processed um, because you're just gonna incur massive latency from just the network traffic and bandwidth that is going to uh, in that, that'll be incurred. You don't want to have, create a system that is going to be very difficult to install and maintain or configure. That's why it might be easier to use sort of something like an XML RPC server for, rather than Celery. Celery does require that you install it, run a couple of monitoring things over the top, and uh, decomposition is the process of splitting up you, the Say if you have one big task and you want to be able, you need to split it up into many, many smaller tasks. So, for example, our initial problem statement was how much, how many images can we detect with a hundred dollars? Now that 
we then split up into individual web pages, and we could actually conduct, we could actually decompose that into components which themselves could be used or processed in different places. And so the, the ability for you as a programmer to decompose your problem to make it useful in a parallel or distributed world is um, sort of up to you, and it's where a little bit of the pain comes from. Load balancing is the process of making sure that all of your workers are actually working. You don't want to be, you know, sitting, you don't want to be spinning up 50 Amazon instances or what have you, and then having six of them actually conducting work, because it will be extremely expensive for you. Message size comes down to being able to minimize the impact of serialization, network bandwidth, and latency, and then deserialization. Uh, you also want to be able to debug things, and if we, we use some abstractions, it can become really, really difficult for you. Uh, and error handling itself, or being able to actually recognize when something's gone down, and can you get the error to bubble up to you without breaking everything else is also important. Now, that is my talk. Now, uh, are there any questions? In the front. Um, there's always high level um, paradigms like, say, bulk synchronous programming. Does Python or any of the tools that you support that sort of high level thinking? Uh, well, I. Sorry, what was the particular okay. package um, that you were talking about? You, you're basically working at the m m mechanical level, you know, threads, pipes, RPCs. When people break down the programs into distributed or parallel, they can use a paradigm like communicating sequential processes, or sure. bulk synchronous programming, or, uh, or other approaches. So, does Python have any kind of language support for those kind of high? There are thinking? a number of um, one of it's actually there are a number of sort of implementations of um, concurrent sequential so CSP. Uh, one of the a really neat package is a thing called Camellia, which gives every single component a message box. And you just send messages to people and ask for things to be arrive in your, in your message box. And you create a, uh, a series of, inter you create this sort of data flow language um, in Python. Now, but as whether or not the, the language itself provides a lot of niceties, probably less so, but there are some things that have been built on top of Python to be able to enable different methods of uh, running things concurrently. Any further questions? Did you come across the... Um, Global something or other. Yeah, lot. yeah, okay. I, 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 uh, let's let's talk about that, girl. So uh, the question was: If you use OS threads in the Python uh, world or you see Python, you're going to encounter the global interpreter lock. Uh, one of my points earlier was that if you're using threading for network I/O, it's probably not going to hurt you so badly. But what that global interpreter lock does is restrict one thread to access the CPU at a time, which means that if you have two CPU bound problems, each running in their own thread, only one of them will run at a time. But because you're waiting so much when you're doing network stuff, it's pretty unlikely. If you're just you know, receiving audio, uh, and you can, you, the, that impact isn't going to hurt you as badly. Um, and if you're used, if, if threads are familiar to you, you probably are going to be okay. But if you want to do lots of computation in multiple threads, then you need to start looking at processes in Python, or at least in C Python. And, uh, that's actually a problem with sort of G event um, or other sort of coroutines, is that um, they use cooperative multi threading. So the the current green thread well, actually yields control back to others. And it needs to, everyone, every, every single thing needs to do it in a, in a nice, polite manner. 
And it's sort of, you can think of OS threads as being able to say that the operating system can sort of shut you off and then push uh, the CPU to, an, to the next thread. Um, whereas with cooperative multi, uh, multi-processing, the thread itself says, actually, no, I've got no more work to do, so therefore I'm going to, give, I'm going to yield control to somebody else. And that's what the yield statement actually does in Python 2. It will actually suspend its own execution and give something else something to do. All oh, right. Okay. So uh, the the point was that I I I, I created this uh, this thing, sort of soft limit of around a couple hundred uh, threads. Now you, that's ridiculous because you can run tens of thousands of threads on a modern CPU, right? And you've got gigabytes of memory, so even tens of couple of couple of tens of kilobytes per thread isn't going to hurt you that badly. Um, I've seen several benchmarks which say that um, when you start to do web crawling, there is because uh, you, know, you will get an increase in performance as you spin up more and more threads to have more requests, but eventually the operating system is going to start to hurt when it needs to switch all the time. And that actual, the, the process of switching threads itself becomes a burden, and then as you spawn up more and more threads, you kind of actually start to degrade performance. Uh, and therefore, what I, what I mean by soft limit is I mean, that's sort of a, it's, it's a fairly arbitrary limit, but you will hit some thing where the, the task switching itself is actually going to be a tax that you will begin to hurt you as your process, sorry, as your program carries on. Well, I mean, so, okay, the, the, just for the uh, benefit of the recording, the question was, once you are, you know, I'm using multiprocessing, and, but I'm also running, using a C extension, in this case, OpenCV. Therefore, is there really actually that much point in spawning up multiple processes? Uh, now, I'm going to sort of admit defeat in the sense of like, this is an example which I thought would be kind of neat to throw around mentally while I was preparing a talk. Um, and there are sort of actually internal buffers and things with inside, and there's, I believe, caching within OpenCV itself. So it probably doesn't like uh, what I've done. And, but I mean, it's really going to be application specific because it may just be the case that you should just spawn up multiple instances of OpenCV, which kind of become semi-servers, which you can then give them new images to sort of pull out. And they can have their own memory and address spaces. And, and, and that would that'd, that'd work totally fine. I, I can't see a big problem there. Yes, so what are the main infrastructures? Because I've only got one computer at home, so I have to you know, use Amazon or Google or PyCloud or something like that, or maybe a university supercomputer. Like, what are the different infrastructures you've used? Well, uh, what have I used? Um, well, for, for, a, for a lot of this kind of webby stuff, like if you're creating a web service, virtual servers are going to be fine for you. Uh, if you want to do technical you know, high performance computing, then a lot of what I've sort of said doesn't particularly apply that well because you're not, I mean, your, your problems are, are different sort of in, 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 in scale because you're actually asking the, the operating system sort of for a node of machines itself and, uh, but you can get a long way with the cloud. Like, if you, what you'll normally do if you, say if we, you, you know, you, you ask Rackspace, you know, give me, give me five virtual machines. They all run on a, a, a local IP addresses. Therefore, the network is going to be really small. You can actually simulate yourself on your laptop. You just create a local, local network. All you need to do then, if you're moving from your laptop to sort of a cloud provider, 
is just sort of change the internal IP addresses. And your environment should actually move itself across fairly well. And if you've sort of got your DevOps scripts right, then the application sort of, if you think of the application in a broad sense, the application itself should know the right way to uh, talk to the rest of, of the servers. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was you could just put everything through a load balancing proxy. So if you have uh, a bunch of virtual servers and you currently are pointing to a single thing, well, you could swap out that single server into a, a, a load balancing proxy, which itself would then fork requests and load balance them between many of them. And that could simplify the process of deployment because you can just add on more stuff as you, as you, as you need it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tim, for an excellent talk.